I recently moved into a new apartment, which I inherited from my grandmother. The room was pretty spacious. There was a big bed by the window, a small table by the bed, and a table lamp on it. In the far corner of the room there was an old closet. The first day I got home pretty late. I went to bed at around 1 am. But some knocking made me wake up. It looked like it was coming from an old closet. When I turned over to the other side, I started to fall asleep. When I heard another knock and rustling from the same place. I got up on my bed and tried to look into the darkness with sleepy eyes. Finally enough, there was no fear as such. Perhaps that was because I hadn't woken up yet. I couldn't see anything, so I turned on the light. When I came closer, I noticed that the cabinet door was ajar. I closed it. Without making a big deal out of it, I went to bed after all. At 3 am, I heard the cabinet door creak. When I looked at it, I saw that it was open again. I felt uncomfortable. I didn't want to get up. When my eyes got used to the darkness, I saw something like a thin, pale hand reaching out of the closet, covering myself with a blanket. Through a thin slit, I was watching something that made my blood run cold. A creature, like a midget, came out of the old closet. It was pale and thin. It had a huge head, eyes round as coins, and a huge mouth stuffed with small teeth. I was terrified and couldn't move at all. The creature came up to my bed. It smiled nastily, looking straight at me, but it didn't do anything. And then it went back to my closet. The next day, I decided to put the closet up for sale. I was ready to give it away for free or just leave it on the street. There was a flea market next door. And it turned out that the closet was antique. And the hoarders took it from me for the first price I offered without bargaining. The next night, I heard a strange knock at the same place where the closet was.
This story was told to me by my university friends. Kate lived in a campus. Her fellow student moved out and she was assigned living quarters with a freshman. She looked a little old-fashioned and a little weird for her time. Her name was Alice. Kate didn't like her from the start. She didn't clean up after herself. There were scattered books and clothes on her bed all the time. The creepiest thing happened at night. She could stand by the window all night, whispering and muttering something. Also, her hair. They were all over the place. Kate noticed that she was pulling out her own hair one by one. The whole room was literally covered in it. It became impossible to stand it, and Kate told it all to her face. She saw her face flushing with anger. She felt the unbearable rage, like her weird roommate was about to explode with a terrible scream and go nuts on her. But instead, with a quiet exhalation, she muttered something and touched Kate's shoulder. Strangely enough, the roommate packed her things and left the room the next day. She was left alone. Kate felt great and she started cleaning. She went to take a shower in the evening. Out of the corner of her eye, she noticed a hair in a litter head. She started pulling it out. It was disgusting. She got a thick, black and long hair. It was her ex-roommate's hair. But she didn't get it all. She kept pulling. The hair turned first into a little ball of hair. Then it became as big as a soccer ball. What she saw afterwards made her horrified. One red eye was looking at her from a lump of fake dark hair mixed with some grease. It was spinning from side to side and then stopped at Kate. That was just a dream. The next day, a new girl moved in. Experiment 0961 is headed by Dr. Dan. Purpose is to test SCP-096 abilities while obtaining complete physical description. D9031 is a 32-year-old convicted felon and former tattoo artist. D9031 is placed inside Bathysphere 303A which is then lowered in the Tonga Trench of the coast of New Zealand. Position is approximately kilometers from SCP-096 temporary containment cell at site. The following was recorded via video surveillance inside Bathysphere 303A between it and Dr. Dan's control site on the New Zealand mainland.
bathysphere 303A reaches final depth of 10,800 meters. It stopped. What now? Do you feel fine? No sickness? Anything? My ears hurt. That should be expected. Now, on your left, should be a steel container. Open it. And there will be a manila folder. Open it and describe the first photograph, please. Nothing. It's an empty cell. Thank you. Please set this photograph face down in the receptacle to your right and look at the next photograph. It's the same cell, but there's a foot in it, I think. Describe it, please. Uh, it's pale and bony. Sort of creepy, actually. Place the photograph in the receptacle, face down, and look at the next one. Okay... Oh, God! Describe the photograph. It's a, I don't know, some very creepy person. Describe the photograph, please. Hell, man. It's pale, has white eyes, and something weird is happening with its mouth. What the hell is this thing? At this point, approximately 13.32 p.m. Eastern Time, Dr. Dan and Experiment Control is notified that SCP-096 has breached containment. The fastest path to SCP-0961 has been cleared of civilians and image capturing devices. And SCP-096 is now being tracked by satellites by a tracking collar. On your right, there should be another steel container. Open it. It's a pad of paper and a pencil. Yes, please draw a sketch of the photograph you saw. Uh, I'm done. Good. Place the drawing in the receptacle on your left and close it. And the sketch leaves Bathysphere 303A in a watertight 
buoyancy container. The other photographs are then incinerated in the onboard incinerator. Uh, what now? Please stand by. SCP-096 is now confirmed to be at SCP-096 one's position and is diving. Transponder signal ends at 9,339 meters as pressure goes beyond the device's operational limits. The camera shows the bathysphere shaking slightly. From SCP-096-1's reaction, it is assumed SCP-096 is on the hull and is visible through the viewport. Cut as the hull of Bathysphere 303A is breached. SCP-096 is recovered by surface recovery team Foxtrot 303A without incident. Sketch of SCP-096 is also recovered, and a quick test confirms no hostile reaction from SCP-096. Sketch is sent to experiment control on New Zealand while SCP-096 is moved to permanent containment. This creepy story happened to me years ago, when I was young. I just moved to the States and worked at a nightclub. Needless to say, I always came home late. One night, I was on my way to my apartment. I was very tired and the only thing I wanted was going to my bed in my room. I came to the door of my house and went inside. I lived on the ninth floor and called the elevator as usual. When the elevator doors opened, I saw a creepy mime inside. A man wearing spooky makeup on his face, white skin, black eyes and red lips. He was standing inside and waving at me, but it felt like he was looking through me. His head was turned unnaturally and his hand was moving in a strange way, more like a robot. Of course I didn't get on the elevator. God knows what was on this guy's mind. So I took the stairs. I was walking up and almost forgot about that creepy dude in paint when suddenly I was fueled by some curiosity and looked down. At that moment I was already on the seventh floor and two three floors below there was the same mime tiptoeing as if he was afraid that someone would hear him. When I saw him he froze immediately like a statue standing on one leg. He must have seen that I was looking at him. He was absolutely immovable, only his eyes rushed from side to side. I got up the nerve and talked to him. Dude, this is not funny anymore. You're pretty good at fooling me. Now stop it. I have no money. I'm very poor. So I think you can stop it right now. After these words, I forced the pace and went up out of the corner of my eye. I looked around and he was standing in a frozen position again, but now he was very close to me, just one floor apart, so I could see the whites of his eyes. 
I was frightened to death. I didn't know what was on this man's mind, or who he was. I spoke louder, hoping that some of the neighbors would hear me. What the hell do you want from me? Leave me alone! The expression on his face immediately changed. It drooped and he raised his hand to wipe off the non-existent tear. Then he climbed on the railing and jumped off before I could say anything. There was a dull blow and I saw the twisted body of this madman on the ground floor. I should have called the police or the emergency services, but I stood stone still due to what I had seen and just was looking down. Then something made me look up the stairs. All I had to do was going two floors up, but what I saw up there instilled terror into me. Upstairs, I saw the same mind that looked down at his body downstairs. His mouth and his eyes were wide open. His hands held his cheeks, like in a famous picture, the scream. I was standing pale and shaking with fear. I couldn't move. And then Mime did it first. His eyes, looking down, turned right in my direction for the first time in that night. I ran outside, trying to skirt that creepy Mime's dead body. I called the cops, but the police found nothing on the floor, as I suspected. But I swear, I saw him there and I was not out of my mind. I'm not religious, but I know it was something that cannot be explained logically. A girl named Leah was afraid to go to bed. Every time her mother read her a fairy tale before going to bed, kissed her on the forehead and assured her that there was no one in her room. But she knew there was. She saw it. The fingers, black long dead fingers emerged from under the bed, out of the closet, and sometimes from behind the door. And she could hear someone's heavy breathing behind it. And so, as usual, Mom read her a fairy tale, said good night, and turned off the light. And at night, Leah was awakened by a squeaky sound. Someone was shuffling and making noise in her dark room. She opened her eyes and looked into the darkness. There were ten scary long fingers sticking out of the door, black, dead, and thin. They swished and moved slowly up and down, and there was someone behind the door. It stood there, breathing heavily. At first, Leah could not even move because of the horror that embraced her whole body. But then, when the door started to open slowly, she screamed loudly, closing her eyes. Mom came almost immediately and hugged her. Her gentle hands stroked and calmed Leah while she kept crying and sobbing. Then she heard Mom's voice from her parents' room. Leah, honey, what's wrong? If Mom was in her bedroom all this time, then who stroked her head so gently? A young man was taken to the hospital in a critical condition. The doctors thought for his life, but his carelessness played a cruel joke on him. Unbelted 
and as a result, numerous injuries, almost fatal. There are no miracles, you will say. He woke up on a beautiful sunny day. There was no one around, just an open window and birds singing in the hospital yard. He called the nurse and his wife Maya, but neither of them was there. He couldn't wrap his head around it. Why there was no one around? Where was everyone? He got up surprisingly quickly and easily and decided to call for help in the hallway. It was cold there. Things were different. There was no one. Absolute silence. Only lamp noise. He went out into the dead hallway. There was nothing. Not even a distant sound from the other rooms. It was like his feet led him somewhere. He didn't know what was going on or where he was going to, but he kept walking down this endless hallway. The hallway led to the big, heavy doors. Behind those doors, there was what he was going for so long. His subconscious was telling him he'd forgotten something there. Maybe there was a phone, then he could call home. But it was a completely different room, it was a mortuary with a bunch of freezers and a big table in the middle. Someone was lying on it. The feet went there on their own again. Who was that? Who was it? It was his own body on the table. And who was he then? I found this phone on the street. It was so old and so shabby, I didn't want to take it at all. But I thought, if I could give it back to its owner, I would make him very happy. It was discharged. At home, I found a charger from my previous smartphone and charged it. It wasn't locked, so I went straight to the phone contacts to inform any of his friends about the missing thing. There was only one number in the contacts, without a name. I decided to call, but nobody answered the phone. Then I texted him, thinking he'd definitely read it someday. In the bustle of the day, I completely forgot about the phone until I got a text message. It was 2 a.m. To say I got scared is an understatement. They knew my name. But then I calmed down and realized that the owner of the phone could be called Nick as well. I texted back. There was a knock on the door. They knocked again. I walked up to the door and looked through the peephole. There was no one there. I got scared. I went to my room and sat down on the sofa. Fear hanged upon me, and at the same time I was hoping it was someone's joke.
I ran up to the door. It was open. There was no one in this stairwell. I decided to call this Joker, warn him that my patience had run out, and now I would report it to the police. This is a story about a young man, an employee of a large and wealthy corporation, who came home late at night. He was walking down a dark night street and saw a homeless man sitting on the ground. Ugh, he's going to beg for money again. I won't give him a penny. Damn fiddlers! As he was passing by a homeless man, he reached out his shaking hand, hoping to get some money. And then a homeless man grabbed his hands abruptly, laughing and saying, Dirt! There's dirt on your hands! Indelible dirt! <laughs> Get off me, you rebel! How dare you touch my hand! My hands, they are dirty. I, I have to wash all of this dirt off. They are both dirty now. I've got to wash it off. He had the words of this dirty old man in his head and his crazy face. It literally freaked him out that night. He pulled his hands off and ran home. When he came home, he ran to the bathroom first, pushing his wife away. He turned on the hot water and started washing his hands. He watched them for 10 minutes and his wife came to find out why he'd taken so long. But he yelled at her and locked the door. He made the water hotter, it burned his hands, but he kept rubbing them with his sponge. He kept washing his hands almost all night and all the next day. His wife heard him muttering and laughing terribly. And then, suddenly, in the evening, he came out of the bathroom. His face was pale, his eyes fell in, and underneath them there were terrible black eyes. It was distorted by a terrible grimace that was hard to call it a smile. Look! My hands are clean now. I washed. I washed them from the dirt. It's been three years since that incident in the village. The well was buried long ago, and nothing more was heard about that creature. We were walking with Max along the river. The day was hot, and we went swimming. It was already a little dark. The day was declining. Then, Max noticed something on the other side of the river. Someone or something was lying on the rocks. We thought it might have been someone who needed help, so without any hesitation, we crossed to the other side. There was a huge tree lying there, and we used to walk on it a lot. When we crossed over to the other side and looked at what was lying on the ground, we realized that this was not a human. It was some kind of a creature. Right away, we remembered that terrible scene from our early childhood, that bony hand from the well, which clung to Max's head. 
it became uncomfortable. Max stopped too. We sat behind the roots of that tree slash bridge and watched. It didn't move. Then Max threw a stone in there. Silence. That's when we decided to get closer and take a picture of this thing. It didn't react to us and it must have been dead a long time ago or without feelings. Approaching slowly, I could feel my heart beating going faster. Something shapeless was lying on the ground. It looked like a mixture of an animal and a human, completely hairless. At that moment, a bright flash of my brother's phone blinded everything around. I guess I felt a powerful blow on my legs and fell. Then I heard a blood-curdling scream. Max grabbed my hand and in a moment we ran away in a mad rush. I heard someone running after us, rasping breathing of some creature. Was it really him? Ray, how did he get out of the well? We noticed an old shack and ran straight into it. We shored the door with some stick and then I noticed it wasn't exactly a house. It was some kind of an old mine entrance. There was silence. We were afraid to breathe. We heard someone or something running around. Then it stopped. It was walking under the windows, breathing heavily. <gasps> then there was complete silence again. I felt a cold puff behind my back and some wheezing or growling. <gasps> my eyes gradually got used to the darkness and we saw a huge gapping mine aperture behind us. I sat at a computer and waited for the lesson to start. I turned it on beforehand because I didn't want to miss the fun that was about to start. My classmate John shared a link to a lesson with a man from the internet. He promised we'd have a good time with the whole class. He has a page on Facebook and his name is very strange, The Curved. The lesson began. Our class teacher told us something about the revolution in France and John was sitting there and giggling, something was about to start. Then, I saw John changed expression. He stared at the screen as if he was trying to see something. Then, I got a message from him. <gasps> Can you see that too? Look, the Lisa screen behind her back. I looked at the screen where Lisa was. A scary picture. There was the curve behind her back. It was someone's creepy crocked figure, but it seemed like no one but me and John saw it. John and Tom, maybe you'll be back to class? Put away your phones! Apparently, Mrs. Peterson noticed John texting me and Lisa. Lisa looked back, but there was no one behind. I did not even notice when this curved figure behind her disappeared. There was laughter and giggling in class. Mrs. Peterson angrily looked at the two of us and continued. It wasn't even five minutes before that figure showed up on the screen again. It was behind Michael's back now. John sat with his eyes wide open and looked at the whole thing too. 
Then something happened that we did not expect at all. It started moving between the screens and walking behind the backs of my classmates. I did not hear what Mrs. Peterson was saying at all. Neither did John, I guess. We were watching a figure that was moving from screen to screen with a curved, vile gait. No one saw it but us. Then it was gone somewhere. Unnoticeably, I texted John saying the figure had gone somewhere. It disappeared. Where did it go? I wish this lesson would have ended already. I looked at the screen and then I saw John's face becoming even more frightened. He stared at the screen and said nothing and didn't even reply to my messages. Then he wrote, It's behind your back. It's behind you. My father used to work on a construction site in Moscow in the early 80s. They were building high-risers. They worked in free shifts, day and night. And they had one terrible story, which he told me. Construction and accidents then, in the 80s and 90s, were inextricably linked. But it wasn't due to negligence or non-compliance with safety rules. But as he told me, because of the woman with inverse head. At first, he did not believe the local workers. They tried to discourage him from working the night shift. But the night shift was paid higher rates, and he often worked nights with several other CIS nationals who had nowhere to go. And at first, he did not think anything of these stories. But in just one single night, he changed his mind. Late in the evening, he went up the stairs to his floor. At the edge of his eye, he noticed the movement in the nearby building. <gasps> he stopped and looked into the night darkness of the stair flights. There was a woman standing on the edge of the floor. Another worker, who was going upstairs with my father, also saw it. My father ran to that building to talk her out of it or grab her hand. His mate ran after him. When he got there, he saw that she was still standing on the edge of the stair flight. My father called her and went to her slowly. When he approached her, she abruptly turned towards him. At first, he did not even understand what was wrong with her face. He saw her sprawled mouth and bottomless eyes. But her face was inverted, her curved mouth was on her forehead, and her eyes were on the place where her mouth was supposed to be. She stood there and looked at my father, and he even thought she was laughing. Then she turned back towards the street. And then Dad's mate ran to the floor. My father couldn't stop him because everything happened very quickly. The guy ran towards this terrible woman and wanted to grab her by her waist. But when he grabbed her, she took a step into the dark abyss and the guy fell down with her. Father could hear her laughing and his mate scream. <laughs> No wonder, when my father went down to check their condition, he did not find any woman there, only his mate from work was lying on the ground. After that, my father worked at the site only day shifts, and when there were no people willing to work at night, their team was disbanded and he quit the construction site. 
the site where accidents had been happening regularly, as my dad's boss used to say, was demolished. It was set to be built in violation of construction standards. 